My name is Mauricio Salatino. I am presenting about building functions as a service platforms on top of Kubernetes, but the presentation on the topics actually apply to any kind of platform that you want to build on top of Kubernetes. So let's get uh, started with it. Um, again, as I mentioned, my name is Mauricio Salatino. I'm at Salavo in Twitter and also in, in Mastodon nowadays. Uh, I'm working full time on a project that is called Knative. I don't know if you have heard about that project. It's about serverless and building functions. So I recommend you to check it out. I will be showing a bit of that later on. And I'm also writing a book that is called Continuous Delivery for Kubernetes, where I'm basically covering all the projects and topics that I'm covering here during the session. Of course, in much more detail because it's like an entire book. The QR code in there will take you to the book and there are some discounts for, for the book later on on the presentation as well, if, if you're interested in it. So the agenda for this presentation, it's usually my, my style of presentation is too much content. There is a lot of things going on. I'm doing live demos and you know everything can go wrong. But for this specific presentation, because I only have 30 minutes, I will be covering the first two bits and, and I will try to go faster on the tools that I'm using because I will provide all the links for you to check all these tools later on. So context about why do we need to build platforms on top of Kubernetes? And uh, I will be doing a live demo showing how that experience of using a, a platform should look like on top of Kubernetes from application development teams and also from operational teams. So why do you need to build platforms on top of Kubernetes? Or the main reasons why I see companies, medium and large companies, building platforms on top of Kubernetes. And I'm pretty happy to say that when I arrived here this morning, I just actually go and talk to a company that is building this kind of thing. So it's, it's a good validation uh, for, for this presentation. You can go and talk to local people about these topics as well. So uh, the main reason to think about building platforms on top of Kubernetes is because Kubernetes actually provides you only a set of building blocks that you need to use to create uh, more complex tools for actually deploying your workloads, right? Like Kubernetes provides you services, deployments, ingresses, and all these things. But when you start deploying real life workloads that are complex, you need to combine them, extend Kubernetes, create your own higher level abstraction layers to make your life easier. Because dealing with those low level concepts, it's complicated. The main reason why we have so many CNCF projects, they are all great because it's they are solving specific problems on top of Kubernetes by using all these concepts and solving more specific problems. So the moment that you start using Kubernetes, you need to start not only learning Kubernetes, but you also need to learn about all the ecosystem and which tools are solving each specific problems. And that takes time, right? Uh, the more larger the company is, the more that you see that one single Kubernetes cluster will not cut it, right? Like the previous presentation about Hypershift actually is, is going into that direction. You will need multiple clusters, and then you need to manage the complexity of having multiple clusters, right? And learning Kubernetes is hard. I've seen this, I've, I've been uh, doing Kubernetes trainings for some time, and uh, I see a lot of large companies that the, the thing that they struggle the most is basically bringing everyone up to speed into Kubernetes and understanding how Kubernetes works. So we should be thinking about abstracting Kubernetes away and building platforms that basically makes the life of application development teams easier so they can consume Kubernetes without actually understanding all the tools that you need to use it. So a platform can help uh, in, in solving some of these problems, right? Like reducing the, co the, cogn the cognitive load of teams that are consuming Kubernetes related tools. Uh, uh, we can create a platforms that basically provide a self-service approach to consume all this complex infrastructure and tools. And we can also improve our software delivery practices but by providing a platform that basically curate all best practices about how, do we, how teams should deliver software to, to different environments. So I've included here kind of like one of my definition of what the platform is. And for me nowadays in 2022, because this is actually changing a lot in the Kubernetes space, a platform is just a collection of services and tools focused on enabling teams with a self-service approach to get the tools that they need when they need them, right? So we are going to be seeing now in a couple of demos how kind of like we implement this with open source tools and how the platform experience should look like. In reality, when you start looking at things and, and the shape of these tools and how do you combine different tools to create one of these platforms that I'm talking about, you will see that it looks something like this. You have a bunch of teams that wants to consume and interact with complex infrastructure and tools. And for that, you have a team building something that we are calling a platform in this diagram that basically expose the platform API. These teams that wants to consume all this tooling on the, on the right hand side, they only need to understand how to interact with that API. 
If these teams are application development teams, they know how to interact with the APIs for sure. So they can interact with the APIs, get the tools that they need, configure in a way that the company, you know, applies all the compliance, make sure that they can get like all these tools very secured by default by just interacting with these APIs. And the platform will use a bunch of tools to, you know, orchestrate Kubernetes clusters, virtual machines, cloud resources, some on-prem services, or even maybe third-party services that you want to consume, right? So, if you have been looking into the platform space in, in Kubernetes, and uh, I've seen this kind of like a lot in the last KubeCon in Detroit and also in Valencia, there is a, a book that is being quoted quite regularly because this talks about the cultural change that you need to apply in your organization in order to start thinking about building platforms. This book is called Team Topologies, that's the website of the book. And it basically describes the interactions between different teams, right? Like having a platform team that is in charge of building this intermediate layer between, you know, infrastructure and application development teams. The main idea here is the platform team treats application development teams as customers. So they build a platform that looks like a product. And if application development teams needs more features into that product, the platform team will start delivering those features. So application development teams can get, again, all the tools that they need when they need them. So I will start with a very, very quick demo of an application that I built to exemplify the use of this platform. And this demo is this very, very simple application. So this application, you can actually access to that instance of the application here. If you can scan that QR code, you don't, you don't need to, right? Like this is just a very simple demo, but it's live and it's running in a, uh, in a Kubernetes cluster that is hosted inside Google Cloud, right? So this application, okay, hopefully some people access it. This application allows you to um, very, very simply you can generate a value here on the client side, and I can store that value. That value should be stored into a Redis database, which is, of course, it's a live demo, so why it should work? <laughs> Maybe internet connectivity or something. Let me refresh and see if it's actually running. <laughs> the, the browser crashed. <laughs> All right. I wonder if it's working for some of you folks. Oh, there you go. I can see I can see the application back in there. Let's see. Maybe too many people accessing at the same time. It's actually <laughs> making any crash. It should have like you know some some um, some uh, replicas, but you know it's running in a different continent maybe. So maybe it's too far away. And I can see there you go. You have all those numbers that people is generating. Of course, you can make it crash, of course. But that's kind of like the application. And the idea of the application, please do not make it break, folks. Come on. <laughs> Be gentle. So the, the main idea of the application is to show that it's a very simple application. It's a monolith application that it's generating some uh, data from the browser in this case and sending that data into a Redis instance that it's also running in Google Cloud. Okay? So that's kind of like my production environment, the thing that you are accessing. It's not very well configured, as you can see, but you know, uh, I, will, I will work on that later. So the idea is that at some point, like the company, the business will say, okay, we need to add a new feature into our new application, right? But like developers will not work in the production environment where all of you are accessing, right? Like we will just need to a separate place to go and do our work. And in this case, what we want to do is as a platform, we want to provide a way for development teams to have a development environment on demand. So they can say to the platform, hey, I need a new development environment to create and implement this feature. I need, to, uh, I need the platform to provision a new environment for me. And I need to get all the secrets or credentials to be able to connect to that environment, right? That's kind of like what we are going to do now. I will just show a demo where I will connect to the platform API. I will send a request and I will get a development environment back that it's being configured by the platform team, but it's automatically provisioned when I send the request. So that's kind of like the demo for like the first demo. We are going to just request a, a development environment. Again, this is a live demo, so be patient. Let, it sh should work. It's Kubernetes, right? So it should work. Uh, so the idea here is that I've extended Kubernetes in some way by using some tools, uh, and I define this new resource type in Kubernetes that it's called environment. As you can see, it's just a Kubernetes resource, a Kubernetes manifest, and it's basically allowing me to uh, set the name of the resource, in this case, team A uh, environment, and I can set the type of the environment that I want to create, in this case, with a label like that says the development in there, and I can set as, like, as an application development team some parameters that are very specific to my team. For example, I want to make sure that when I create this environment, 
there is a database, like a Redis database, in the same way that we have in the, in the production environment. Because it's a Kubernetes resource and my platform API is exposing a Kubernetes API, I can just send this uh, resource using kubectl apply or any other Kubernetes tool that allows me to send a resource to, to the cluster. Again, Wi-Fi, why not? <laughs> Maybe a cluster is in a different continent or a different city or something. It was working before. But as you can see there, like after we get the, the return back there, the environment was created by the platform. And as a user, because again, it's just a Kubernetes source, I can just list all my environments, right? So I'm listing my environment there. It's not ready yet because it's been just provisioned. We just created that request six, uh, 17 seconds ago. So it will take some time in order to be created and to be provisioned. But what I will do now is, uh, as I mentioned before, as, as an application development team, as soon as I get an environment created, I would love to be able to connect to it. And in order to connect to it, I will run a command because I'm using a very specific tool. But you can imagine that if you are provisioning a, a cluster in, in Amazon or in Google, you will probably need to run a command to connect to that cluster. In this case, I'm using a tool that it's called bcluster that I will talk a little bit about later on, but that's the only thing that I'm doing here. I'm just connecting to the environment that I've just created for this application development team. That's why using bcluster connect and the name of the environment there. Again, <laughs> remote cluster, it might take a second. When I was trying it before, it was almost automatically, but you know, it, it will take some time now to uh, do the network connectivity. So hopefully it works. At some point, this is going to connect and we will be able to interact with our development environment, right? Like we are not connected anymore to our platform API. We are connected to our environment and we can start uh, developing uh, our new feature. This environment, it's going to contain an instance of the application that was running in production configured to work. So I will be able to test any change that I do, kind of like in a very production-like environment in this case. At some point, it will connect. Let's go back to uh, the slides here. <laughs> so the next step would be the application development team actually needs to create a new feature for the application. And this is when I wanted to talk a little bit about functions, right? Like you can go and change the monolith application. And uh, of course, you can go and change it. But if it's a, a, like a large application, usually you will have a long process to change that. Functions can help a lot uh, with extending uh, monolithic applications that you already have by adding features that are not included in the same source code. So you can actually iterate functions much faster. Usually functions are uh, described in, you know, when you can like create purely functional applications. But in this case, I wanted to show how you can extend an existing application by creating a function that creates a new feature and it allows you to implement something that it's not by changing the monolith application that we just created. So, uh, the application development team, it's very interested in just extending the application. We will be creating a function. Good thing about functions is that you can, can create functions in any language that you want. And we will be able to deploy our function into our development environment because our platform team that defined what the environment is actually installed some tools for our function runtimes in there, right? And that's kind of like our second demo. But the problem with the second demo is that it depends on the first demo for the environment to be ready. So we will see. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> All right. Let's see if I can connect. Hopefully I can, but it's actually not connecting to the cluster. So we will see. Let's, let's wait for a bit. I, I will probably run out of time for sure now, but <laughs> let's see if it connects. The idea here is that as soon as we are connected into uh, our environment, we should be able to use some tools, again, that were created by the platform team or at least decided by the platform team to create functions and deploy functions into our environments without writing Docker files or without writing YAML files to do the deployment. It's not connecting to the cluster, so what would you expect? Uh, and I, I do not have my 5G phone here with me to connect to it unfortunately. But that's the idea, right? So imagine that I'm connected to this cluster. Could that, what? Again, live demos. I should have a recording. And you know, my father told me you should get a recording. I didn't do it, unfortunately, because I really like the risk. But you can imagine, you can, you know, you're like creative people. So you can imagine what happens when you connect to a cluster. You can interact with the API server, right? So it's, it's not connecting, but what we can do instead, and you can, you can uh, 
think that this will work, right? When we interact with a new API server and with a new instance of the application, by using vCluster, we'll be able to access to that instance of the application that runs inside that environment with a completely separate URL, right? So we can actually go and interact with the application in the new environment, but it's not connecting, unfortunately. So let's do the second thing. The second thing was to uh, build, uh, and so to create and build a function using uh, a CLI that uh, I, it's called func, and I can just run here. Let's see if this works. So basically, if you want to create functions, we can use tools that are specifically created for, for that use case. So I'm creating a new, uh, I'm going to a new directory, I'm creating a new directory called average, because the feature that we want to build is we want to calculate the average of all the values that are stored in this environment. And then I will use this command that is called func create, uh, that basically will create a new template uh, for a function, in this case using the Go language, and then consuming a template that is called Redis, because we need to connect to the Redis database to get all the values, right? And the template is located in this repository there that is in GitHub. So I have a repository in GitHub that was created by the platform team that contains multiple templates in different languages that can contain curated dependencies, for example, in this case, to connect to Redis. This, of course, also requires the network because it will go and fetch the template and create like the, the function here. Uh, which unfortunately, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not working. But as you can imagine, at the end of this command, we will have the template of the function created in our local development environment, uh, in our local laptop in this case. And then I will be able to use another command that is called func deploy to deploy that function into, um, into, um, into my, deploy, my deployment, my development environment. So the network is not working at all. Let me try to switch Let's do this, and let's try again. No, no. Uh, it's the wired one, it should be working, come on. Network preferences, I will try, I will try, uh, you know. Uh, connect, whatever, okay. You're, you haven't joined the session to see this, so anyways. The idea here is to uh, use that command line tool that allows you to create functions and then deploy functions to the development environment. So the demo goes like this. You, I created a demo, I created the function, I just modify the function so it actually calculates the average, and then I deploy it to a development environment. As soon as the function is deployed in the development environment, I can interact with the function and actually make some requests so I can see the, the, the average being calculated. Unfortunately, I cannot show that. I promise you, you will see a, a video as soon as I create a recording of the demo from my hotel room. Finally, uh, just for the sake of, of the story here, uh, we have created here a function in our development environment, right? And that's running in there and I can interact with it and everything is fine. But as soon as the application development team is done with, the, you know, with writing the functionality, the platform should be in charge of taking this functionality from our development environment, from our you know, development GitHub repositories into our production environment. And the, the way of doing that, it's very different from the tools that we are using for developing things, right? Like I was using this func CLI to create and deploy functions in my development environment. I, don't, I do not want to do the same things for our production environments. So for production environments, what you usually do is you probably apply some kind of like GitOps and also here is where you run all the compliance on top of you know, the things that you are deploying into, into, um, into your production environments. So for this demo, like the third demo of my presentation actually shows uh, a tool that it's called Argo CD that it's configured to sync you know, changes into our live clusters. Let me see if I can see here. Um, so that's the application that it's not working anymore because I'm just not, now I'm not even connected to the network. Let me see if I can connect back. Uh, but the idea here is that our production environment, the application that I showed at the beginning that was working, is actually configured in this repository that's called Cube Day Japan Production. And inside this production directory, that it's not there, come on, uh, basically contains the configuration files uh, for, um, for deploying this application into our production environment. And then we have a tool like Argo CD or Flux, which is basically <laughs> now not even showing, but it actually have the configuration to go and check into this repository and sync all this configuration to the live cluster. Unfortunately, the network is, is not collaborating with us today. Uh, the network is not even connecting, so there is not much that I can do there. 
But let me try to uh, summarize the idea here. So let me go down at the end here. So two things here that I wanted to talk, right? Like the first, the first idea was to use a tool that is called B Cluster to create virtual clusters uh, to create development environments. So you can quickly create these environments where your developers can interact with and interact with the application and a copy of the application in a safe way, in an isolated way. And then you can use tools like FunCLI to actually create new functionality without pushing your developers to learn about like how to build containers or how to write YAML file to deploy these applications or functions into a Kubernetes cluster. By doing that, you are kind of like abstracting away all the complexity and all the things that they need to understand in order to do these deployments or to quickly iterate over different functions. And then when we are going to more like into a production environment or a more sensitive environment, using tools like Argo CD to sync, you know, the configuration of a cluster that it's stored in Git into a production environment. It's much more safer because you remove the manual intervention uh, against the cluster. So you can keep track of all the changes of configurations on these environments. Um, we will go back now a little bit. So that's, that's kind of like what, like what the demo is, what the demo is showing. You can actually imagine how, how, how is that working. But one of the things that I kept in mind when I was building this demo is that all the tools that I've been like I've used in the demo and to create environments, to actually sync changes, to install applications, uh, I haven't created any Kubernetes operator. And I think that this is what's coming for next year, right? We have been, uh, I have been working on Kubernetes for the last, last six years, and I've seen a lot of companies creating their own custom controllers, custom operators for solving this, their, their, their challenges. But now that CNCF projects are maturing, there are a lot of projects that are being graduated now, like Argo CD. Uh, I've seen uh, a lot of uh, adoption of these tools. And the, like, people is actually starting to think that when you extend Kubernetes, then you need to maintain all these extensions. And maintaining these extensions are pretty hard. So one of the key points here is that if you are planning to extend Kubernetes, you need to make sure that there is no other you know, project doing something similar that you can reuse because you will save a lot of time on maintaining components uh, otherwise. So for this demo, uh, I've used Crossplane to create that environment resource. Uh, Crossplane is a project that allows you to create uh, cloud resources using the Kubernetes APIs, right? So you can actually create a YAML file to create a cluster in different cloud providers, and Crossplane will have a way to connect to that cloud provider and then create those resources for you. So you can create you know, a cluster and a database by just creating some YAML files. You send that to the platform cluster that has Crossplane installed, and Crossplane will go and create these resources. And then you will be able to use kubectl or any other Kubernetes tool to list these resources there, which is kind of like a very interesting approach. And it, this is actually bringing a little bit more of that multi-cloud approach to, to the space, right? Because you can create clusters in all the cloud providers by just installing some extensions and also providing the credentials so Crossplane can access to these resources. Crossplane allows you to also create compositions, which is pretty like a very, very important concept. In this case, uh, you can create something like I did, like I created a resource type called environment that basically represent a bunch of cloud resources being created together, right? So I created a, a, a local, like a development em environment that basically created a virtual cluster, but you can create like a staging environment that actually goes and create a Google Cloud cluster for you. And the interface for the users will be the same. You can create very, very similar YAML files to create different environments and to provision different cloud resources across multiple different cloud providers. And that's a pretty powerful idea, and that's why Crossplane is becoming really, really uh, popular in the platform space. Bcluster, as I mentioned before, it's a quick way to create virtual clusters inside the same cluster. So you are creating isolated API servers and reusing the Kubernetes scheduler like the main, the host scheduler for, for all these API servers. This is pretty good when you want to isolate workloads and when you are, want to isolate like API access, right? It's, it comes very, very frequently when you talk about like uh, using namespaces. It's not good enough for your use case because again, you don't have enough isolation between different tenants. And when uh, you cannot create different clusters for different tenants because that's too expensive, you need multiple control planes. So this like big cluster is a, an open source project that gives you kind of like some, some good benefits there. You can have isolation without paying the cost for creating separate control planes for that. There are other projects like Hypershift, of course, that 
ap applies a different approach, but it's in the same space, multi-tenancy, right? Like this is also very important in the platform building space because you will have more than one cluster. So that's kind of like what I was doing there. When I sent the request to the platform API, like Crossplane was using vCluster, which basically is just using Helm to create a new vCluster and deploying my application into, into the environment. Then I was using a Knative, which is the project that I'm working for, for the runtime function, right? Like uh, the, the function runtimes, right? So if I want to deploy functions into Kubernetes clusters and scale them down to zero and scale them up based on demand, uh, you can use something like uh, Knative and the func CLI comes from there, like the Knative functions initiative. So that, I, that initiative is focused on allowing you to quickly build functions in any languages and uh, deploy them without writing Docker files or YAML files. And again, I use vCluster and Knative in conjunction. There is a, a plugin that allows you to use them both, so you can reuse the same installation of Knative for multiple vClusters. And then I, at the end, I use uh, Argo CD just for, for GitOps again, just to sync uh, you know, Kubernetes resources into a Kubernetes cluster. And that's the thing that I showed you before. There are some other tools that you should be checking out if you are uh, looking into building platforms, like Open Feature is something that it's, it's growing in the CNCF space. Dapper is another project that I will be looking onto, uh, which is more in the developer space. So to make your developers life easier, no matter which language they are using. Cloud events and CD, CD events are other initiatives that you should be looking at. And of course, if you are building platforms, you want to measure how good the platforms are. So you should be looking at Dora metrics. And I'm, I'm building a POC showing kind of like all these tools together and how can you measure how efficient your platform is. So check it out if you're interested. The presentation topic and the examples and, and the demos that you can, of course, run in your own lo local laptops if you want. I should have done that now that I think of, but I really like the, the remote cluster. Are described in this uh, series of blog posts that are that is called like challenges of building platforms on top of Kubernetes, where I'm trying to cover why people is thinking about doing these things, the tools that exist today, and the challenges that you will face while you are trying to adopt all these tools. And of course, at the end, that's the link uh, of the GitHub repository that contains all the step-by-step -step tutorial. I promise that works if you try it out on, on your local laptop. You need, to, you need to have a lot of RAM to run all these components locally, but actually, if you have like 32 gigs, it should be all right. Uh, and again, the idea was we started in production, we changed our application by creating a development environment, we deployed the function there, and then we use GitOps in order to apply back the, you know, the configuration into our production environment. The tools that I mentioned here, like Crossplane, uh, Knative, uh, Dapper, um, Argo CD, also like I mentioned in the abstract Tecton that you can use to build all these container images and the Func CLI are just an example of things that you can combine together to build a platform experience. But of course you can go and choose your own tools, right? Like if you are provisioning cluster hypershift or like, you know, like copy, like a uh, cluster API can, can work as well, of course. Uh, but the, the key point here is that if you're building platforms, you should focus on developer experience on making sure that you provide like an API for your development teams to co quickly consume and in a, like an on a self-service approach that they can go and request new environments on demand. They shouldn't wait for like, they shouldn't create tickets and wait for, you know, the operational team to create those environments. Automation here, it's, it's key. Thank you very much. I apologize for the demo not working. I can actually install it locally later on and show it to you if you're interested. I apologize once again, I will share the recording. That's the, the link to the book and you know, that's my Twitter handle if you have any questions or if you, you know, want to dig deeper into these topics. If there are any questions right now, I'm happy to answer. Yep, one question down there on the back. I will check the connection again, and now the connection will work because you know how it is, right? Like, it's still not working, so I'm happy. <laughs> okay, so the concept made a lot of sense, so Thank I you. wouldn't worry too much about the demo. Um, I think the one thing I didn't quite understand with yep. the concept was, I think, where Argo CD is involved. So, mm -hmm. the are you creating a new manifest that, like, automatically, like, kind of understands, okay, this is what the function it's supposed to do, and it builds out um, whatever the custom resource would be for that and copies over to production. I think I'm just confused about that interaction. Perfect. No, I think that the question makes a lot of sense because like the demo can I quite cover that. So the idea is that we use Func CLI to deploy to our development environment, right? 
In that case, we do not create any YAML file. The CLI actually do a deployment to the cluster. But the CLI can also have, have kind of like a dry run mechanism that actually gives you the YAML that you need in order to deploy that function. Mm -hmm. So in order to move the function that is running in our development environment to our production environment, the only thing that we need to do, something that I showed in the demo, is we go to the Git repository that contains the production configuration, and we move that YAML file into that production environment, right? Of course, at that point, the platform team will need to replace, for example, the database connection string and where the database is and all the production parameters that needs to be applied at that point. And we do that by creating a pull request into that repo where the platform can actually run all the automated checks to make sure that the changes are going to work. And as soon as you merge that pull request into the main branch, Argo CD will sync that into the production cluster and we will be able to interact with that function in there. Okay. Gotcha, yeah, so the YAML that is being created um, I guess it's, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with how the function That's right. service also works. So I'm assuming the function service, it abstracts, like it'll create the config maps and everything that's necessary for the developers. And basically all of that, that's being created, all, all of those YAMLs will kind of be like sent over to, um, the pull request that's going to be leveraged by production. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yes. I got yeah. you. That the idea is to provide tools that help developers but also like the platform team and maybe like operation teams can use in order to actually get the, the configuration that you need to apply into production. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. That, that was a very good question. Time is run out. Run out. Thank yeah. you very much, folks. I appreciate that.